right. So this uh, is the last section of the book. So we miss uh, this one, which is an introduction of this last section, and we have two remaining uh, chapters. So the the few things is, as I said, it's just an introduction of the last two chapters, but we attempt like revisiting a bit why feature selection is important, learn about different feature selection methodologies, because uh, um, uh, like a differentiation, which is uh, nice to know, uh, and uh, learn about how feature selection and other parameters tuning can influence overfitting. Then there is a case, a case study, um, but there is no code for this case study because apparently it's a quite quite uh, computationally expensive. So th there is an explanation of what's happening within this case study and why they they choose this, uh, this this case. Okay. So as I said, it's a part, uh, this part is the last section of the book, introduces us to greedy and global search methods mm -hmm. for feature selection procedures, uh, providing an overview of the methods for investigating a potential set of solutions to achieve the best model performance. Okay, feature selection. Uh, here I really summarize. <laughs> Uh, basically, um, the, 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 the best part says that, uh, um, so um, if we are able to subject our predictors to the very best ones, so to the very uh, ones that are influencing our response, so we achieve the best. Uh, on top of this, it says that um, you might want to to be precise, thoroughly uh, sticking to all predi to uh, all predictors. You might want to compare them in cover, all of them, and see how and then calculate the model, see the performance, how it changes, and then pass to the other two, and then go on. Go on. This is very computationally expensive. So it's absolutely uh, suggested to remove predictors because it can mitigate this um, uh, this difficulty. So to take consideration are some some uh, um, model al alternatives, which are so we know about uh, these models, but. Uh, um, we need to think about our data and decide uh, within uh, the best models that will be able to release the best performance. Mind that support vector machine neural network are sensible to irrelevant predictors. So things may change if you have a predictor that shouldn't be there or maybe it's too much. Uh, while linear and logistic are vulnerable, vulnerable to correlated predictors. So again, if you check for correlation support vector machine, it might be unuseful instead searching within linear and logistic models would be like must do. Okay. While there are other models like uh, random forest, which they take care of uh, irrelevant predictors for, for so it, it, it is a, a different procedure and we talk about it later. Okay, so this is the part that basically uh, the most important part of this chapter. So they tell you about uh, methodologies for future selection and basically I've read another book uh, about this thing, and uh, another chapter about this thing, and they have made differentiation in the other book just about filter and wrapping uh, and wrapping methodologies, while intrinsic is can be both of them uh, inside a model. While here, uh, 
they listed as a three different methods. So uh, the first methodology is an intrinsic methodology, so implicit. And this is when this happens inside the model, so you don't do anything. So this uses a greedy approach. And um, I think a greedy is a sort of like, like deterministic uh, uh, approach for, select, for selecting features. So that makes um, a local optimal choice and identify a narrow set of predictors. This can be, as I said, three and rule-based models three, multivariate ad adaptive regression splines, which creates new features, but takes care. Uh, so basically, they are both, they can be, uh, these intrinsic uh, methodologies can be filter and wrapper as well. Okay, there's some, some type of models which uh, have this intrinsic methodology and reduces or split the predictors uh, um, uh, and others such as this Mars, which creates new features, okay? There are uh, other regularization models such as LASSO and which uses penalties. And these are uh, basically, these are the, uh, the type of intrinsic methodologies which implicitly uh, select uh, your features to achieve the best model performance. Then there are two methodologies which are filter and wrapper. And these two are initial supervised analysis and selection. And in particular, it uses um, odds radio cutoff. Um, and um, so uh, things that um, so you, you do before making the model. So you filtering your predictors, such as using the odds radio cutoff, uh, statistical significance. Um, to, and you attempt to capturing the, the, the large trends before applying the model. Okay, that's more uh, in the next chapter. Then there is um, uh, this wrapper uh, methodology, and this is um, an iterative search, and it adds predictors to the model based on model performance results. Okay, we, we have mentioned that. So basically, any time um, uh, starts with zero. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a regular procedure. Now you say you start with zero and see your model performance, your model results. Then you add one predictor and see, and, and so on and so forth. This can be both greedy and no, not greedy. Okay. The greedy is the backward uh, selection. Uh, RFE, regressive features, elimination. So that's where you start with yeah. everything? And yeah. then you just get rid of things that don't seem important and the model will do that for you? Yeah. Or the, at least that function will, right? Yeah, you can do, I, I think it's, um, um, this, I think this when is I did chapter two, yeah, I was going to say, when I did chapter two, I remember there was an RFE function that I used to do that, I think. Yeah. Um, but what what is the non-greedy aspect of it? Non-greedy is a global feature selection. So you do like globally. Um, and uh, it says in particular, a non-greedy approach will reevaluate the combination. And this happens when, for example, in GA, genetic algorithms, or simulated annealing. It's an example of this. It takes, basically, uh, it, it incorporates randomness. It's a sort of um, use of probabilities that that uh, predictor can be, um, uh, can be, um, using the model or not. So basically, uh, these are called wrapper. Uh, so they are both iterative searches. 
and um, one is back forward backwards and one is um, like a uh, random approach backwards and randomness are the two main differences in particular non greeting is the global search uh, I don't know if you'd like to add more uh, something else because this is now um, do you have any experience with simulated than kneeling maybe I, I've never used either one of those myself um, Jim and Ethan yeah I've, I've um, in in um, in exploring the solution space for um, something complicated like XGBoost, um, I've I, I've 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 used it. Um, I um, find that um, I, I have a way with with some of these uh, uh, algorithms to to overfit, like. Um, by by the time you get um, super optimal, then it's it's not necessarily better on unseen data at, at some point. So spending a lot of time on uh, you know getting the computer to run overnight, <laughs> um, tuning has a limited payback in terms of whether it's really an improvement, but. Um, Simulating annealing and and uh, uh, say the other techniques are handy to to shorten the uh, search through the solution spaces. I I personally haven't used the the greedy search, but I have used um, <clears throat> a Bayesian approach through a package called Optuna in Python. Um, but I would also agree that um, I spent a lot of time on it and I did not get a lot of great results in comparison to the greedy method. Now that might just because of my particular problem, um, I'm still going to use Optuna just because actually the way it's the package is set up is so much faster for some whatever reason, like the way it's coded on the back end is so much better. Um, and it's it's like a framework for hyperparameter hyperparameter tuning, so they have a lot of other functions. But definitely, I'm less impressed by the optimization itself. Yeah, I like this uh, this visualization. I had uh, so I did an attempt. Uh, replicating, uh, but I've spent more time understanding uh, what's happening inside these two visualizations. And those are really uh, interesting because it, it makes, so it's clearly, uh, it lets you understand what's happening within a greedy and non-greedy uh, optimization. You see that the, the non-greedy, the global optimization, it's random, Basic, basically, so this um, dashed, uh, this dashed, these two dashed lines are the the central points uh, indicate um, the, the, uh, the 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 central points and where to start basically. Okay, so we start from there, and then uh, this uh, in both approaches. But uh, what's happening in the global optimization is a replication um, of paths within, within the predictors. So, so uh, as you can see, there's lots of, lots of more uh, uh, traffic, okay? Things to, uh, that happens within the, the global optimization instead of the, the greedy approach. So this is random uh, while this other is uh, takes consideration, of course, of uh, sort of probabilities, okay, uh, that happens. Um, while this other one, the, the, uh, these are two uh, greedy optimization, this orange and, and the blue. And you can see that um, um, this is uh, simulated, simulated from, from this 
Goldstein price equation. And uh, what's happened here, um, the, there is a, a starting point for the orange that uh, then reaches the, uh, its, its lowest value. Because these are the predictors, X and Y, uh, the response. So if, if I uh, like to see my response versus my predictor, so I want to see how, how my predictor influences the response. This one here, it, it's going down, basically. The, the orange I'm talking about. While the other one has a, has a different uh, uh, behavior, uh, and uh, it starts uh, again from this central point, but then spread and, and completely has a, a, um, uh, a different uh, um, uh, so, so basically you find two points, one uh, on a side and one on the other. And this, I, I believe that this is the uh, accumulation of the, the density uh, in, within these two points. Yeah. What else they said about this? I'm not saying, oops. I did open the book. Ah, okay. It's here. Okay. So this is the function that we, we will see later, another, another uh, of the same kind. And uh, it, it's an interesting thing. And basically, they, they said a bit more about this, say, uh, panel A, so which the, 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 the one with two, okay, is this with orange and blue. Says shows the results of two greedy methods that uses gradient descent to find the minimum. So this is a cost function, the expression of a, of a cost fun, function, uh, or, um, and so search for the minimum value, uh, the minimum sum of square uh, of residual sum of square. And Mm, then the first starting va value in orange is the top right. Okay, so this is the uh, top right here. And moves along the path defined by the gradient and stores a log minimum. So the gradient is basically, I do the derivation and search for the minimum value within the curve, I don't know. Want to add something, maybe? Um, so it's unable to uh, re-evaluate the search. It's unable to re-evaluate the search. This is the first attempt with the orange. The second attempt with the blue, starting at the, the central point, which is minus uh, uh, zero is minus, minus one, and um, starting at minus one and uh, and minus one and minus one uh, one and minus one. Oh, okay. Starting here, minus one one. So the top top uh, uh, level uh, follows a different greedy path. And after some course corrections, find uh, a solution close to the best value iteration, which is the iteration number 131. 
While panel B, which is simulated on kneeling, and it's a global search, and it's random. Uh, uh, so con uh, in conclusion, uh, find, able to find the optimum minimum at iteration 64. So in this case, this global approach is, met, uh, is better. I would have thought you'd see more points in the in the greedy one. It says there's 131 points underlying all those things, but it looks like there's 20, 15. But whereas the global one, it looks like a it looks like a, a a ball of yarn. It's a it's a mess. But there's fewer steps required to get to the optimum. Yeah. Huh. Or, is the, or, or, or is just the last iteration? I don't know. But uh, huh. it's a difficult to interpret a bit. You know? Because this is the first try, then this is the second try, and then there is iteration 131. So these are the first two tries. The first attempt, second attempt, and then... so. But anyway, um, let's go back there. Uh, so if non-linear intrinsic method has a good performance, one could proceed to a bracket method combined with a non-linear model. Okay. Ooh. Okay, while uh, if linear intrinsic method has a good performance, one could proceed to a wrapper method combined with a linear model. Okay, so if you use, you try intrinsic first. No, if you have no linear, or if you have linear, and then you try again with other methods like a wrapper or filter, for example, if you use a of a wrapper, then you follow nonlinear, nonlinear, and wrapper. Non okay, so this is um, the, the things that, um, I was talking about earlier. Uh, we we use this uh, night nice function. Okay, so this is our function, and you can imagine this is our, our data. Okay, this is our predictor number one, predictor number two, predictor number three, until predictor number 20. Okay, so uh, this is a simulated system from uh, SAP and uh, it's a nonlinear function. So you can imagine we, we do like synthetic data with this function. We imagine to know uh, the value of the coefficients uh, adapting a function to our predictors. So we use this and we run some some uh, uh, simulation. Okay, this is uh, in in this re repo, this fast selection simulation, and um, it's it's a it, it's a different repo. Uh, here there are some some uh, like files. Uh, you can see that uh, the many uh, try. Okay, uh, we have a, a, a template, and then which is here. Then you can uh, change um, the sample size, the extra, the correlation, the seeds, uh, etc. And then uh, so so they basically tried with different sample size, different data, and run many times uh, this thing, which uses a linear model. Um, a Mars, what is it? Mars method GCDR and a support vector machine, um, multi layer perceptions, Kiras, and then do um, CNN. 
and then finally do some some uh, um, uh, tuning with the grids and everything. I found some uh, some difficulties because I tried. No, there's more 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 models like GLM, XGBoost, uh, bagging, random forest. So they they use it actually. They they did. So they use uh, they they fit all these models on the data, but basically what's happened is that. Uh, this is correct. Okay. There is this uh, uh, function here, which basically set the data. It's, it's this function here is this one. Uh, is this one here? This function. And then they they set the parameters for making this function varies. Uh, the um, uh, con consideration are that the, the predictors are uh, the consideration. So they set the predictors are to be as to be generated from an independent standard normal random variable, and the epsilon, so the error as a random normal, means zero and standard deviation three. Okay, so they 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 run this model with this function, all these models with this function. Then what what they do is adding extra predictors. Okay, they add from ten to two hundred extra predictors, uh, and this is the result of of all these simulations. Okay, it's the, this basically. Um, additional noise variable. So anytime they add new uh, this this starting point zero for all linear, nonlinear, and trees, eh, it's the it's it's the the function, the base function with twenty predictors. Then they add new predictors. Let's say fifty predictors. 100 predictors up to 200 and and see how things change adding predictors for example linear model here we have a, a linear model and a glim net in comparison and a linear model as a greater rmc than a glim net and these are linear models and they even make a difference between starting with 500 observation instead of 1,000. And then you can see the nonlinear method and trees, for example, shows a different behavior. Uh, this green one is CNN. It's the one that has always starting from this uh, support vector machine. But then this this one marks it's more more stable, more stable. So you it's it's basically indifferent if you add predictors or not for the Mars. And uh, what's happening within trees is the same. If you add predictors or not, doesn't change much. But if, if you search for the minimum, you know. Okay, so one more thing that uh, was interesting uh, here is uh, uh, okay. As I said, um. If you do this with tidy models, if, if you do this with tidy models, you have this function, okay? This big, 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 big function. This function here makes um, this function with uh, some, some parameters, okay? And this is found in caret. 
then they use this train control for setting the, the samples method and do a new function for uh, selecting things. I think that, that there's new methods for, for doing this and that would be uh, slightly um, easier, even visually with less code, even with IE models. Then they said uh, this ratio is very important. The ratio of the size training set to the number of predictors. For example, we started with 20 predictors and 500 is the uh, number of observations. So we have a ratio of 4%. Instead, if we uh, increase or, or decrease the, the, the predictor, things change, obviously. So this is something to take consideration of the, this ratio. Okay, so let's go back and end with the, the last uh, two things. So mind overfitting and overfitting can be uh, like, uh, can arise from other parameters, <laughs> other parameters or um, because of feature select, selection overfitting. And so a, solu a solution can be um, that other parameters uh, would be evaluated um on uh, a data set that is not used to estimate the model parameters so you use like validation assessment set and so you are able to avoid other parameter other parameters uh, overfitting while feature selection overfitting it's a, something slightly different so you need to consider uh, if this is applied before or after the resampling process. So basically, if you do feature selection uh, before resampling, it's different than if you do feature selection inside the resampling. Okay, so you have different uh, outcomes and um, uh, Best thing is to do inside feature, select, feature selection inside the resampling because otherwise you you do feature selection and then you do uh, resampling or you do resampling and then feature selection so things change so the process provides a more realistic estimate of the predictive performance and but there is an increase in computation okay so this. Finally, this is the case study. So there is no code for this, but uh, what they, they do is um, it's a case when um, they incorrectly combine feature selection and, and, and resampling. Okay, let's see when, when this happens, when you do. So the goal is to identify a subset of predictors with 80% of accuracy. This is what they want to achieve, okay? So they start with 75 samples from uh, each of the two classes, uh, yes or not, okay? Then they have 10,000 predictors and uh, choose for 70% of the training set. Then they run a temple cross-validation and an implicit feature selection method, okay, using GlimNet and random forest. So result of this is is sixty percent of the model accuracy. So they decided they they want eighty percent, okay. So they 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 started with an adjustment, and first thing tried with the principal components to see what's happened, and then linear discriminant analysis and partially square. But uh, the result is not uh, satisfying because they uh, basically haven't been able to identify the groups uh, clearly and, and conclude something about these two classes. 
So they do a second adjustment. Uh, first, identify and select the predictors that are the univariate signal with the response. So they do a t-test and select the, the predictor based on the, on the value of the t-test. Then they do uh, the rank by significance and choose the, the top 300 uh, for, for modeling. Then finally do again PCA on the 300 predictors and plot it. So they have been able to finally identify the two groups. So they satisfy, and this might be able to achieve the uh, an higher accuracy, higher than 60%. So this second method provides a clear answer, showing a complete separation of the components. But I, I will expand a bit more on the conclusion about this. So next chapter, it's greedy. Such a simple filter and backward selection. And the, the final chapter will be global, so randomness uh, to find globally best. Thank you. <laughs> Microphone was staring up oh. the ceiling. <laughs> Thanks, Federica. <laughs> okay. That hyperparameter tuning is is a hard one. <clears throat> I actually had that come up at work recently, and um, I didn't get any better results, but. When I use the box Cox transformation, that dramatically improved the results of the model. Just so y'all know, because <laughs> I learned that here. <laughs> yeah. It's nice when things you learn here uh, come in handy. Yeah, yeah, that was really cool. It, um, you know, the transformation didn't always lead to a normal distribution, in which case the results were worse. But when it did lead to, uh, in this case, the transformation of the Y variable, um, it was much better than any of the hyperparameter tuning I did with XGBoost. And it's not even supposed to work with XGBoost. So <laughs> that was a big surprise. <clears throat> Yeah, that that that's that's uh, that's something you know because it facilitates uh, even the the visualization of the information of your model. Yeah, yeah. I guess I hadn't really looked at the distribution of the y variable before, but you know the fact that you needed to check that with the box Cox transformation led me to to find some interesting results. Good stuff. No. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So next week, no, in two weeks' time. Okay. okay with Brandon. Greedy. <laughs> yeah, I'll be greedy. Somebody else okay. is going to be not greedy, I hope. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> See you then. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.